Good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, if you're from Scotland, welcome to your Parliament. If you're from further afield, welcome to Scotland and we're delighted to have you in our Parliament for this Festival of Politics. My name's Ben McPherson. I'm the Member of the Scottish Parliament for Edinburgh Northern and Leith constituency, which is just over here. And I am convener, uh, sorry, vice convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and a previous minister for the Natural Environment and Rural Affairs, which is all relevant to today's discussion. And it's great to be here for the 2024 Festival of Politics. This year celebrates the festival's 20th year in the 25th year of the Scottish Parliament and of uh, devolution uh, here in Scotland. And we've had 20 years of this festival of provoking, inspiring, and informing people of all ages from every walk of life uh, and to have this for, for five days of spirited deba debate, including today. Like all of you, I'm sure, I'm looking forward to the discussion and hearing from uh, everyone who wants to contribute uh, the thoughts and views on the issues that we're discussing today. But I think you'll also agree that it's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even where there may be differences of opinion and that we all treat each other with respect at all times. We are delighted that you can join us today in Not the End of the World, a thought-provoking topic in partnership with the Rowett Institute at the University of Aberdeen. And later I will be inviting you to get involved with questions and comments I would also like to thank our BSL interpreters, Andy Carmichael and Tess, uh, Tessa Slaughter, uh, for being here today. Uh, if you're keen to know uh, thoughts out there as well as what you hear in the room, you can do so by following Visit Scott Parle on X, otherwise known as uh, previously as Twitter, or on Instagram at, at Scott Parle. And I should also add that this event is being recorded and will be available on the Scottish Parliament's YouTube channel at a later date, if you want to have a look. I'm very pleased to be joined on the stage today by this illustrious panel. First of all, I have uh, Professor Boka uh, de Roos, uh, Anne Mata Bersang, uh, Bersing, sorry, and uh, Robert Moran and Mike Robinson. Professor Boka de Roos is Professor of Nutrition at the Rowett Institute at the University of Aberdeen, uh, an internationally recognised nutrition scientist with 25 years of experience in design and delivery of human dietary intervention studies to assess how nutrients, foods and diets affect our health and uh, has obviously been in Scotland for, for some time uh, but originally is, is from the Netherlands and it's brilliant, brilliant to have you, you with us. Robert Moran is a partner in the Brunswick Group in Washington, D.C., uh, a critical issues advisory firm. Uh, Robert is a management consultant, communications strategist, futurist, and writer. And we're uh, delighted to have you here from across the pond uh, here, Robert. Uh, Anne Marta is a, a program manager at Climate Exchange at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, delivering expert advice and analysis to the Scottish Government. Before taking this role, she managed a portfolio of research on climate resilience and societal change, informing public engagement and policy across the transition to net zero. And Mike Robinson uh, has been Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society since 2008. This role, uh, and over the course of the last 25 years, has seen Mike be an instrumental in informing policy through joined up collaborative action, particularly regarding sustainability and climate change. So I'm sure you want to all join me in welcoming them and we're delighted to have them here today. So, so as I said, really keen to get thoughts from all of you who've, who've given up your time to, to come and be part of this discussion. Uh, but first of all, I'm just going to provoke our panellists with a number of questions just to, to get into our discussion. So first of all, um, 
researcher Howard Frumkin at the University of Washington argued for hope in the face of the climate crisis, writing that hope is empirically justified and that there is no basis for concluding that now our fate is sealed. So I'd be interested in views on how do you as experts and advisors personally balance the considerations around hope versus realism. And we hear a lot of discussion about climate thresholds and tipping points. Is it is it too late to act or is there hope? And given that uh, Mr. Hurd, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Mr. Hurd from, is from the University of Washington, um, perhaps our guest from Washington DC could start us off. Sure, sure. I mean, so I'm... Uh I'm a rational optimist about most things, and especially in regards to climate and energy and, and water and how they all connect. Um, like, this is not to minimize the challenges we have. We have a lot of challenges. We don't, we were talking about this earlier, we don't have as, as many problems with, like, fresh water here as we may have in America and other countries, but, um, but we have a number of shared challenges. We also have a lot of brain power and a lot of innovative capacity. And I just think about the innovation just in my lifetime alone, just on the energy side. Um, and then thinking forward in time, the things that are going to happen. So this country has already made a huge leap forward in, in terms of sustain sustainable energy. Uh, but I think other countries are going to follow suit pretty quickly. So we might not be able to do wind, for example, due to intermittency in the United States, but we could do solar. Um, and I don't know when exactly, but we're going to have fusion power at some point. That will be a huge game changer. Um, and so, you know, they always, there's, I'll just close with this. When you look at a new technology, people always overestimate how quickly you can scale the technology but they underestimate the impact of that technology over time, right? So we don't use steam power much anymore, right? I mean, do we? Not really. Um, we invent, you, know, you all invented it, but we don't really use it that much here. But, you know, it's, it's true that, like, when we think about new technologies that are coming online, and there are a bunch of them, and we can talk about hydrogen and what's being done there, too, it's like, you know, we might be impatient, and we, we, we will almost always underestimate uh, or overestimate how quickly we can scale the technology, but then underestimate its impact. So I'm, I'm optimistic about what we can do. Started off with some optimism, so that's a good place to... Um, who, who would like to, to contribute next? Professor DeRoost? Yeah, so... Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the technology because indeed that has moved forward really quickly. Um, and I think that's where we get the promise from, the opportunities and uh, what we, something we can look forward to. But I think when it becomes difficult is when the human element plays a factor, kind of how do we change behavior? Um, and for that, we need to understand what's going on. And that's why, like, yeah, we need the technology, we need to move forward, we need to kind of, we expect certain advancement and what you say, it may go quicker in the end than we think. We need to prepare the models, but then we need pe to convince people to kind of move, move with us, right? And, and um, I think that's often when we get stuck a little bit and that is also what intrigues me, kind of how, how do we understand how human behavior moves with technology? How can we convince people to do the right thing, what we think is the right thing or what models think are the right thing to do, um, and evolve with that process. So if we see improvements, we can actually stimulate people. And if you look at, for example, um, human conception about um, climate change, there wasn't really that much about 10 years ago. It's only 10 years ago, but then we've had the blue planet effect, we've had the greater effect, we had the COP26 effect. And suddenly we see it a lot more in the media and we see the perception of people change. And I think that's something we need to look, look at, kind of how can we get the people with us? And there are huge opportunities there too. And, and as an expert advisor in social change, do you think that as well, Anna Marta? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree that there are a lot of changes 
that can come from tackling the climate crisis that, that are really good uh, for society. So, um, for example, doing something about fuel poverty, doing something about the amount of green space that we have in our cities, the ability to, to move around walking, recycling, or, or, or moving actively in other ways. So there's a lot of, of keeping different thoughts in our head at the same time. Yes, climate change is a huge crisis and we have to do something. The world is going to change and we have to do something in the face of that change. And there's the big technology changes and we have to pair that with our individual use of that technology and how we relate to, to the world around us. You know, STEAM is a great example because it was the future once and now it's not anymore. So, so these things change. And, and we, you know, as humans, we have an, a phenomenal ability to, to, to embrace change. If we all think about our grandparents and the time that they were born in and the change that they saw and the change that we've seen in our lifetime, it's, this is uh, something that we have to take seriously, but it's something that we can gain a lot from if we do it in the right way and we consider how we bring everybody with us. Absolutely. And Mike, you, you were speaking as we walked up the stairs about your, your role in Stop Climate Chaos Coalition here in Scotland, as well as a, a multitude of other different uh, parts that you've played in, in the Scottish consideration of, of how we, we play our part in, in addressing climate change and making the challenge. Um, do, you, do you feel optimistic? Um, it depends which day of the week it is. Um, so yeah, I, I actually, I've been involved in this for a long time and I suppose actually I am reasonably optimistic and I think that's partly because if you spend enough time in this space, you spend time with the people who are trying to solve this issue. And there's an awful lot of optimism and positivity to be gained from that. There's, I think I've sort of realized over time, some of our frustration is around timescales, mm. that anxiety that we need to solve it immediately. Mm. And that's not realistic. If you did, you'd break so many things and annoy so many people who would get changed the next week anyway. So there's a process to be gone through and that's actually quite a difficult thing to pull back and recognize and work with because that, temptation is to deal with it instantly. I think I'm optimistic because I, I wouldn't still be in this space if I wasn't reasonably optimistic because I've watched lots of people get involved in climate change for two or three years and then burn out. And I think it was Arnie Nest, the conservationist, who said, if you see sadness in the world, you should do something about it. And so as soon as you start to think about, okay, what can I actually do? What can we do? What are the solutions? That's a much more positive conversation. If you only talk about the science, you go round in circles starting to question the science and you don't really go anywhere. You've got to move to the next stage. You know, this is a journey that we're on, so what's the next step? And there's always another step. So in that sense, I think you should look to what can we do about it? And when you've done that, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? That, to me, is a very positive conversation. And the other thing I would say that I think I've learned over the last 25 years is because the science is so strong on this and so well understood, the, it's almost inevitable, this sense of direction. The bit that isn't is the speed that we get there. And that was really brought home to me by finance companies a few years back. Um, they were saying they were at a meeting in Paris and there were several trillion of disinvested funds on the international market looking for a new home because of disinvestment programs. And they were surprised that coal had become uninvestable. And that just made me think, God, you haven't read a single thing on climate change for 20 years. And so one of the things I think there's real positivity in is if you understand this issue, you can understand some of the direction of travel. Where do we need to innovate? Where do we need to invest? What do we need to do about it? So yes, I remain reasonably optimistic most days it's, it's very uplifting to hear to hear that and uh, you, you talked about Paris and of course the the Paris agreement is is something that, that is uh, either quoted by or referenced by policymakers and also put to policymakers as the as a scientific basis and uh, multinational agreement to, to to, to work towards to focus on uh, how, how do you balance that th that concept of the the tipping points and that that optimism um 
I mean, Paris is a difficult one. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting space. It was definitely one of the more positive um, COPs, but there's what, we're on 29 now, so we've been meeting for a long time talking about this. Um, I like to think there are positive tipping points, and there are tipping points in every sector, in every space, where things are starting to build, understanding of the issues is starting to build, certainty around the core solutions is building, and that actually is a tipping point in itself, because if you don't have certainty of the direction of travel, where do you invest, where do you innovate? And investors are typically incredibly conservative. You know, even, even years ago, we had a meeting with pension funds, and even with a 25-year guaranteed feed-in tariff, they wouldn't invest in wind. And, you know, that's about as safe an investment as I could think of, but they wouldn't touch it because it was seen as too, too risky. And I think what's happened is the nature of risk has changed. So Paris is really helpful in terms of getting that overarching commitment, but it isn't enough on its own. And while government's meeting every year, probably the remarkable thing that came out of Paris is that a massive document produced by 800 scientists, summarised by a small handful of them, put in front of governments and agreed by 180 different nations, came up with anything at all. It's, that's the honest truth. So, but I'd, I'd like to think there are positive tipping points in behaviour that we're still witnessing and still to have. And we have considered just in, in the recent answers around whether we already have the solutions for combating climate change, whether that's uh, technology or uh, the, the need for continued scientific investigation and innovation. Uh, and and uh, do, do you feel that we already have the science and technology and um, perhaps and Marta you could elaborate on that as well as you know you made the point around social change um, point around funding and political will has been made you know where where's the balance for you in, in these considerations you know I don't think that we have the solution because I don't think there is our solution. I think there's many solutions and we need many technologies and we need loads of things to happen. And, and we have that. You know, so spending a lot of time discussing whether it's this technology or that technology, whether it's exactly that colour of hydrogen or the, hydrogen or the <laughs> other one, you know, because as, as, hydrogen can be any colour you like. It, there's a, there's a, a whole rainbow of those ones. There's something about saying, let's just do the things that are obviously going to be useful and, and there are many 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 of them it, it's I'm not saying that that's easy because it involves change but I think there is something about that how green are we going to be that is actually killing some of the action because we end up discussing minutia rather than actually getting on with with a lot of this so when governments ask us uh, or some of the fantastic academics that we work with, you know, which solution should we go for? They say it's not about choosing one over the other. It's about looking at one problem and choosing something for that, choosing maybe something else for, for another part of, of dealing with climate change. And I just want to add as well that, of course, looking at Paris and looking at risk, what has really come to the fore in the last few years is that we are seeing the impacts of climate change now. So, so there's also that part of taking action um, and that, that both spurs people on, but also is an, an, an added um, uh, urgency to the whole thing, I think. And I, I would imagine that that sense of trying to do everything all at once as the... the the call for action collectively from the United Nations and, and across the world is harder for both governments and populations to to galvanise behind, perhaps than say, for example, when I was growing up, where the the ozone layer was the, the kind of one prominent issue, uh, where of course success was achieved and and and, and improvement was was made, and uh, the, the, there was you know there's there's lessons to be learned from that. So. Is, is, it a, is it about how do we look to where our strengths are everywhere in the world? So um, in Scotland, we have huge offshore wind capacity, for, for example, and, and, and clean water technology. Um, the, uh, Robert, you were talking when we were, when we were having our, our pre-discussion about solar in the US, and do you want to maybe touch on that? 
Well, I'll just share um, two things. One is an observation that I think is might help the group and sort of is, is that I discovered that I had in the last year. And the other is about two technologies that are probably controversial, but we should just have that discussion. Um, so the first is, you know, in the United States, so that's where I'm from, so I can only speak from that perspective, but uh, the Congress and the Biden administration passed something called the Inflation Reduction Act, which ha- didn't really have much to do with inflation, which had, but had a lot to do with infrastructure and new forms of energy production, et cetera. I was skeptical because I thought it was central planning, which I don't think works very well, but I, so I was skeptical. But then what I saw with many clients um, was how much they were investing. And then what I continued to see was just a, a couple of things. One, we have a, a lot of brain power that's working on this stuff. And, a lot, and, and they're inventing new stuff just literally every day to try to push things forward. Two, there is the money. Like, you, we can assign a lot of cash to some of these uh, investments. Um, and three, the thing that's slowing us down is largely, like, local red tape. I don't know if they you, you all use that term. But in America, it's like if you need a pipeline to move ammonia because you have to move – because that's how you actually move hydrogen if you're trying to do green hydrogen. Getting the pipeline approved is just a pain. It's really hard with all these local neighborhoods, right? So my big takeaway from all of this is we can make – do like a moonshot. We could – and I think we should. Um, we have the technology. We have the know-how. We have the cash. It's a rich world. So I think we should just do it. Now, to um, to raise just two more controversial technologies, I, I'm of the view that it's – multiple choice it's all of the above and we give it a shot so there are two that i support that that i think the environmental movement and people around the world are very sort of scattered on one is nuclear which i think we should do and there's arguments about that right uh but there's a lot of stuff about how you could do nuclear much safer now etc uh and the other is gmo which i also support because we can make genetically modified seeds and crops that make more drought resistant uh, harvests, which is probably not very important here, but it's very important in America and Canada and uh, North and South America. So I know those are controversial technologies in some parts of the world uh, and in some parts of the discourse, but I do think that they should be at least considered or put on the table as, as options for us. Nuclear is a very significant political discussion here in Scotland in terms of um, in this building and when Parliament sits. So uh, thanks for we raising that. Three Mile Island in the U.S. and I think the American left is really sort of is moving towards nuclear energy in terms of climate now. But whereas most American po- public opinion was sort of concerned about nuclear in the past, so I know it's controversial. But and of course, one of the the challenges is. Uh, whether it's here in Scotland or elsewhere, the, the areas where we still need to see reduction of um, fossil fuel, electricity and, and other energy. And Professor DeRuz, you were talking about agriculture um, in our pre-meet. Do you want to say anything about yeah. that? So where we've seen really kind of obvious reductions in greenhouse gas emission in industry, electricity, building... Uh, since the 1990s, we haven't seen a similar reduction in agriculture and transport. And that's exactly where we need to make progress. If you look at the food we're eating, we're producing, like 30% of greenhouse gas emissions approximately is coming from our food system. So it's what we produce, is what we eat, what we consume. So there are considerable gains to be made. And within the nutrition area where, and the food systems area where we operate, like this was not really a topic. When we would go to academic conferences, nobody was talking about this. But in the last probably five years, this has changed completely. And where we went from um, having to change the health of the nation, we're now not just talking about cha- needing to change the health of the nation with what we produce food-wise, but also needing to change... Uh, greenhouse gas emissions by our food choices. And there are actually very clear opportunities to do this. 
uh, like if you look at the big models that have been prepared worldwide, not just here in Scotland, there are three main routes to do that. First of all, we probably should eat less of what like grid sectors produce most of our carbon emission, which is um, the beef industry, the dairy industry, and some of the tropical fruits we are important import from somewhere because we're not just inflicting damage here, we are inflicting damage kind of in, in very biodiverse areas elsewhere. So that's one thing. The second thing is that we are simply eating too much. So like if you look at the nutrient requirements, kind of what we should be eating to sustain ourselves, we're eating far more than that. And that is obviously resulting in global obesity and overweight epidemics. And then the third issue is, is waste. Uh, with waste, we have actually made really good progress. Um, like in different, across countries, the estimate is that about 20 to 30 percent of what we, we have in the food system is wasted, mostly in the livestock sector, a bit less in the crop sector, and obviously there's waste at home as well. Uh, but actually, if you look at food system, actually what we waste uh, and then what we actually eat in excess, the second bit is more important than the waste. So and a lot of people are forgetting about those, those issues. And that is something that people can do at home. That's something you can do with your family. This is something you can do as a nation or indeed globally. There are very clear solutions. But then there's also the readiness to change. And that differs, like where, where you've grown up, whether you've grown up on a farm or you've grow, grown up in an inner city, whether you have perhaps kind of living in, in poorer socioeconomic areas or richer socioeconomic areas how much influenced you are or in influenced you are by the media are interested in this topic. So we did a big survey uh, in Scotland uh, in the past year about readiness to change different aspects of the diet. And I think people generally are to some extent for certain aspects, not others. And there's simple things you could do. You could indeed reduce your beef intake, but also... Um, all the sauces you put on top of your food, like the ketchup, the bronze, bronze sauce and all these things have quite a, a considerate climate uh, impact. Um, so the impact can be made there already. And it's actually the younger generation that is much more ready to change than the older generation. And that was a very clear. So for any aspect, for any change, it was the younger generation that was more ready to change. And I think that actually gives me hope because that means this is the, the, the generation moving forward. But that is also the generation that has the highest meat consumption, the highest red meat consumption. So these are interesting aspects that come from research and that gives us, yeah, give us clue what, what we could be doing. And now working with the Good Food Nation Bill, for example, gives us some areas where we really would want to invest in. Thank you. Got a range of generations with us today, so I look forward to hearing their different thoughts and perspectives. I mean, I think, Professor De Ruiz, what you said about um, the benefits of uh, climate action by by changing lifestyle uh, and it almost being like a secondary benefit in that you know more active travel is more exercise, less emissions in our urban environments, less uh, lung disease, uh, less obesity if we're eating better. So. I think these secondary benefits are really, really interesting and um, perhaps easier to motivate people with, both in terms of making their own personal contribution, but seeing it as a holistic benefit as well as a climate imperative. Do you want can to say I, something I, about that? Yeah. On that because yeah. This, this is where, you know, the, the question, not, not the end of the world. No, really, because taking action on climate change, for example, through diet, has such obvious health benefits that it, 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 it is no-brainer actually a lot of this but it requires so much change that it is really hard and, and we have to change our, our whole systems and our economies and you know all of these things but but really when you look at it those co-benefits you think why haven't we done this a long time ago we should do it climate crisis or not you know they, they, because it does make sense for us as, as humans in terms of a lot of the social problems that we have, a lot of the health problems that we have. So, so there are real opportunities there that, you know, that, that makes this a, a good crisis, if I dare to say that. That's a, a brave statement. That's a very brave statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't, there is nothing good about climate change. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing good about climate change. But when we have to make the change... So, for example, if you need to deal with sea level rise, 
you can build a massive wall that keeps the sea away and it blocks the view from your house. Or you can do something about the sand dunes and the grasses that you have and the kind of soft coast that, that, that the sea can, can come and go on. Um, the quality of life from choosing one or other of those options is huge. The impact that it will have on our communities, that's what I mean. This is an opportunity to do some things that would really benefit us mm -hmm. as, as humans in terms of our health, in terms of our communities, in terms of our skills, our innovation, you know, a lot of the business. It, it's, it's amazing the opportunities that we have. So, so that's what I'm saying, you know, we, we should, we should be optimistic because we have the ability to do this and we can achieve a lot more than just taking action on climate. So not the end of the world and a motivator for positive change that we should be undertaking anyway, as well yeah. as a climate imperative. Mike, you want to come in and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the audience. Out there really, I, um, basically, <laughs> no, I mean, there are so many of these things that are so obvious and so sensible and so straightforward and seem like, why wouldn't you do that? And yet we don't really do them. So to me, it's not about... Um, you know, it's the, the issue about optimism is about whether we do it, not what we have to do. Um, but we are, in some cases, at a very low starting point. And buildings is the most obvious. And I like to tell this story because it happened in the Parliament here. Years back, I brought a, a Greenland Inuit uh, MP across to meet the Environment Minister. And it was the beginning of February. And uh, we met upstairs and the advisors had opened all the windows in the room because they thought the man from Greenland might be to overheating in a centrally heated building, not recognising that he lives in a centrally heated building in Greenland. And um, he left the meeting and he said, I have never been so cold in my entire <laughs> life. Um, and uh, the point about that, actually, I suppose, if there is one, is only that um, we have neglected simple things like um, home insulation, properly looking after the housing stock that we have, a response to the cost of living crisis was to throw money at people to help them pay the bills or try to suppress, you know, the, the cost to them over the winter. And there's potentially another issue going to happen this winter. So, but actually, a sustained programme of making their homes actually fit for purpose would have been a far more climate-sensitive response and probably a better response for their health as well. And I think there are quite a lot of these win-wins. And I just keep bumping into them all the time. You know, I had because I've been involved in this space, people come to me all the time. A guy came up to me the other day, reckons he could save a couple of health boards 20 million pounds a year by putting solar panels on their roof, but he can't get through the red tape. So there are win-wins all, all over the place. So one of the things I will never agree with the minister saying, if the minister say, says this, is they've done all the easy stuff. No, they haven't, eh? <laughs> Well, somebody who represents the most uh, urban, densely populated part of Scotland, uh, improving our, our our housing stock is absolutely a, uh, in terms of its energy efficiency, is absolutely an issue that I come across every week with the people I serve. Um, is there anything the panelists would like to say before I bring our wonderful audience in? I'd just, I would just say one thing, I'd just to get off my chest, really, is um, <laughs> is actually that there is a skills deficit out there. We have not spent the time explaining to people what this issue is or to understand the solutions to it and then but we're sort of expecting people to work that out and do it anyway and uh, we don't really teach it in schools very well but actually more worrying to me is we're not really teaching it in the workplace and so there is a transition needed in every sector and as a response to that we need a skills support in every sector every sector agriculture is a great case in point with huge economic opportunities for the country as a whole and the individuals uh, who could go into those sectors as well. So, again, a, a secondary benefit. Um, so, um, please put your hand up if you have a question. Lots of... Right. Team, are we ready? OK. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to take them one at a time. If you maybe direct your question to one panellist... Um, if you've got a specific ask and if you want to say your name who you're from uh, if you're representing an organization etc so i think this gentleman here your hand went up i think when i was speaking at the beginning so i'll bring you in first uh, and then we'll take the lady behind you um, if that's okay uh, my name's henrik belder and i've been in this uh, climate game for probably 
close on 40 years now, and I'm utterly shocked about the platitudes and comments and lack of, lack of the concern of the dangerousness of the whole situation. Um, for example, uh, two or three years ago, one Christmas, David Attenborough took a, uh, went off to Alaska and took a piece of permafrost on the end of a stick and lit it, and it burned like a gas torch because effectively there was so much gas in it that it could burn like a gas torch. And we've been recently told, I've recently read that there's twice as much carbon locked up as methane in the permafrost and the clathrates as there is carbon in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is a very, very dangerous situation. It's all to do with positive feedback. And positive feedback and technical terms like that are just not understood by anybody unless they're an electronics electrician, uh, electronics uh, person like myself. And they are very, very dangerous. And well, people, and, people the panel, sir? And, and the panel are just ignoring all this danger. And it is really, really important that we get this message across. I so mean, you think more, more, more negative campaigning on it, is that? More, more, we need somebody to get on the television and say, this is how you calculate your own greenhouse effect. And it's only slightly more complicated than doing a VAT return. Because every fuel, for example, every, every fuel can be, can be, um, okay, I think we, we, it can be recorded. Can, so it can be panel. calculated as, as, as number of, of kilograms of ice melted. Say you, you travel a mile, you melt something like 90 so, kilograms of ice this year, next year, and for the next several centuries. So and that's the, how bad it is. So the personal and collective effect of, of our own uh, behaviour, our own activity, do we, need to, do we need to be more alarmist? You need to know, Sorry, sir, I'm bringing the panel in now. Thank you. Anyone want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, 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 well, I mean, I don't think anybody's trying. To, if, if we're glossing over it, then we're not giving it justice. Nobody thinks this is a fun issue and everybody's concerned about it. However, I also think there's a really important point in this, and that is that we have had a lot of alarmism, we have had a lot of anxiety about this. And I actually think there's quite a, a, quite a problem in polarising this issue. It should be everybody's issue, everybody's concern, everybody needs to have a part in it. And there is a danger in pushing it, always talking about the worst of everything and demanding perfection has got in the way of progress. So we do need to keep a balance in this. It's not to diminish it. If anybody thinks that we've done that, I, hope, I would like to say I have never diminished this issue. That's why I've committed the last 30 years of my life to it. However, I actually think how we communicate it is absolutely critical. Most people do care, but don't necessarily know what to do. And I don't think it helps if we just paralyze them by reminding them all the time how awful it's going to be. Uh, and Marta, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just want to say, because I see a large group of, of quite young people here, and, and I think that, you know, for them, it is really important to have the, the, the view that you can do something about it, that they can, you know, educate themselves to, to jobs and to, to, to a life where they can either actively do something about climate change or do whatever they want to do in a climate-friendly way, because that is what we need to do. We need to change the whole of society to be climate-friendly, you know, to, to, to actually take account of this. And, and I don't think... Yes, there is a, there is a role in uh, setting out the seriousness of this, but I don't believe in scaring people uh, silly, because they're not going to be able to act if, if they are paralysed by fear. Um, so, so that's why I, I think I want to focus on the solutions. I work in this field because I take climate change seriously. But, but it is about saying we can do something and we have the resources, both intellectually, financially, in, in any way, to do that. So, so it's how we do that that is my concern. Thanks for that thought-provoking question, sir. Um, the lady behind you, I said, was next. So and then I'll... Okay, Take a question um, from this, this is a question for you, Ben, actually. Um, when's the Scottish Government going to publish its energy policy, introduce a frequent flyer tax, and expand organic agriculture in Scotland? 
Well, I think you, you should ask your MSP to ask the Scottish Government. I'm not the Scottish <laughs> Government, uh, although I am uh, very proud to be a, a member of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, so these are questions that we are obviously probing uh, within the committee, and you'll know that there's a new bill uh, that's going to come to the Parliament. So, um, But if, if you want that in writing, in terms of an answer to that, I would encourage you to ask your MSPs to write to the Minister. Um, you want to... Ask a question. I, I'm, I'm aware of the different hands. I'm just going to bring people in uh, as, as I can, OK? So um, just at the front here, and then I'm going to go to the front here. It's more of a comment, actually. Um, and I'd like to say that I totally agree with Mike about progress, not perfection. Um, I am embedded in education. And um, I think that there's an awful lot of... The, the issue of climate um, chaos is really important because there are not... I, well, I know that there are roadways and route pathways to um, structure this for young people in schools and education. And our teachers are not trained in this field either, so they're delivering aspects and topics within um, the curriculum. Now, I've taught in the US, I've taught in England, I've taught in Scotland and um, working with the National Grade Standards for Science, for instance, it's, it's very prescriptive, but there's a very easy way to align um, climate and sustainability into the curriculum, and the same with Scotland and, and England. But it's about empowerment of the young people. It's about empowerment of the teachers and having those pathways and route ways so that they understand when we're talking about food, when we're talking about water, when we're talking about energy, that they're following a pathway of learning. Um, and, I mean, particularly in the US, they use um, um, depth of knowledge in their, in their programs um, and understanding that technology is out there. One of the key things for me is that 8.6 billion tonnes of plastic have been produced globally since the 1950s. Now, that plastic isn't going to go away. It's, it, it will take forever for it to, um, to break down, but it needs to become circular. So actually understanding the circular economy, the circular economy of our waste, of our food, of our energy, is really important. And that isn't within, it isn't within our mindset. And when we're talking about change and empowering people, if they can understand the, the pillars of circular economy and sustainability, that it will give them a forum and, and uh, ease that climate anxiety. Because what we're seeing with ch young people in schools, many, p many children and young people in schools watch Newsround, for instance, BBC Newsround, and it brings fear to them because they're seeing bushfires and floods and um, all these disasters. And so climate mental health is another issue that we need to consider. But having those pathways, knowing what you can do within those pathways is really important. Thank you. Um, so we've got a lot of young people in the audience today. If any of you want to say anything, please do put your hand up. Um, I think the youngest hand up so far is here at the front. So if you want to um, say something, sir. Right here, right here in Maroon shirt. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not that young. I'd like to think I'm still young, but um, I mean, I'm only 22, so on, not... <laughs> thank you. I shall try my hardest. Um, my name's Jack. Um, I've just graduated from the University of Glasgow with a degree in Scots law, um, and I've taken an interest in um, environmental law specifically. Um, I wrote my dissertation on a number of cases that went through the European Court of Human Rights recently um, about climate change. Um, I'm not sure if the panel would be familiar. I'm aware we don't have a like a climate lawyer on the panel. Um, however, the... Um, the end result of those three cases was one was accepted quite thoroughly and the other two were thrown out rather convincingly. Um, and those three cases have brought me a lot of hope. Um, they were brought by um, the mayor of a town, um, a group of young people. So um, to all of the people younger than me in this audience, uh, please know there are avenues for you to act even now. Um, and also a group of um, older women in Switzerland, uh, which was the case that won. Um, However, the response from governments all across the Council of Europe to um, that victory in that case was um, renewed calls in the UK to leave the European Court of Human Rights. 
and in Switzerland, the government that actually lost that case, and which, to my understanding, has quite a right-wing government right now, um, they had calls to leave the court as well. Um, so I'd like to think that um, the law can bring hope um, to people, um, and it gives you like an avenue to do something about climate change. So the, the challenge and opportunity of, of using the legal process, and how empowering is that, and the considerations about political motivation and political reactive forces. Panel, Absolutely. do you want to say anything about that and uh, education as well? Do, do you want to add something to that quickly? Oh, a different question. Okay, I'll try and come back to you, okay? Well, I might come to that. Um, do you want to just swap? Or, um, yeah. and then, <laughs> um, carry on. Carry on. Any? So I was just going to say, you know, the U.S. is common law. Scot Scotland is common law as well, right? You only use common law, not common law. Yeah, common law. And common law evolves over time, and that's what that's its strength. That's why it's, in my opinion, the best sort of legal framework that we have. And, you know, it's going to evolve just like it evolved from the Middle Ages through the industrial era into what we have. And we're just going to watch the law evolve with case, case after case after case, and it will build on itself. And so I'm optimistic. And the wonderful thing about common law is – it is collective intelligence. That's what makes it so strong. It is all these courts and all these people working together and eventually creating over time a body of law that makes sense for the society they live in at the moment. So I'm, I'm optimistic about what can be done in that regard. Okay. okay. Go ahead, mate. Yeah. I think that I think a legal avenue is a really important avenue, but every avenue is not enough on its own. A political avenue isn't enough on its own. Just having legislation doesn't mean it's going to get enacted. You need lawyers there to create rules. You've got to have a bit of carrot and stick. And I think sort of the positive in it, if there is, is first of all, the number of cases around litigation around climate change are escalating all the time. So there's going to come a point where this is so socially unacceptable that businesses are forced down a particular route. Now, the advantage in tying it back into the education question quickly is if you're clear about what the solutions are that you should be pursuing, not only does that drive innovation and investment, it also gets you off the hook because you're going to be moving into areas that are growing at, at rapid rates and away from those where you're risking litigation. I think these two things work hand in glove because it's not all going to work with lots and lots of carrots and opportunities. That's the nice positive message. It's also got to work with sticks and there's absolutely unquestionably more and more laws, rules, litigation cases coming forward all the time that are narrowing the scope of play for businesses in this area. Thank you very much. So I, 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 please excuse my f flippant remark in that we, 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 we actually do have half an hour, so that's why if, if I feel I need to take three at a time, I will. Um, but I'm trying to spread around the audience, so I'll try and come back to you, sir. But um, there's a lady at the back with her hand up that I would like to come to next, and I'm going to come over to this side, okay? And then I'll come back to you later, all right? So just because we've got half an hour doesn't mean, you know... Try and keep it succinct if you can, um, but I know the said. space to express yourself. Before my question, I wondered whether Bob Moran was referring to gene editing or gene manipulation. And to the woman on his right, I am quite sure that there are islands across the world where planting grass will not hold back the sea, and so that may apply in some contexts, but not all. But my question, essentially, perhaps, is to Mike. Uh, I had an event last year with with Simon Sharp on his book, Five Times Faster, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The question to you is, do we need to be five times faster, eight times faster, or ten times faster, and, and differently optimistic and innovative? Wow. <laughs> we need to be as fast as we can possibly make it. Um, but it depends what you think, I suppose, um, the measurements, the parameters in which we're operating. I guess one of the things, in some areas I think we should be five, ten times faster where we know the solution and there's not really a good reason for not pursuing it, um, that we should get on with it. And actually in some cases we're starting to see that. There is exponential growth in certain technological areas that we're seeing, like the adoption of EVs, where I think the industry has understood that that is largely the future. And you are starting to see very serious growth. Solar photovoltaics, you're sort of seeing the same globally and actually the efficiency of solar panels has changed so much yeah. 
that a mate of mine who bought solar panels 15 years ago has just taken them all out and put new ones in because they're so much more efficient. So when you know the answer, I think there is that opportunity to accelerate processes very quickly, and we should absolutely embrace that. We should support it as well with legislation and funding and be consistent in that. It's not good enough to just do something for five years or three years or whatever. We've got to commit to the things that we know are happening. In the areas where we're less certain or where people maybe don't understand or make the connections, we do, I think, need to take the time to help people understand why these things make sense. Because otherwise, I think you're just causing longer term problems. And I think that, to me, is the balancing act. I don't, you know, we could sort of solve it tomorrow if we just became an autocracy and annoyed everybody. But if we want it to stick, we need everybody to start, or not everybody, but we need most people to come on board and understand the motivations and reasons for doing. And so those areas, I think we do need to be a little bit more careful and considered in the way that we progress. Did you still want to come in, sir? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to this gentleman, then yourself, and then the gentleman behind, okay? Um, so, yeah, please. Uh, this is more or less a continuation of that last question. Um, it's really encouraging that the panel are all optimistic and they've all taken the view that we need to progress slowly. We can't rush into things for very sound reasons uh, that we need to take people with us. But my question is, coming back to the chairman's initial remarks, is it going to be sufficient or is climate changing so quickly, possibly or possibly not with tipping points, that the realistic solution, I mean, the realistic answer is that climate is changing quicker than we can deal with, and we're going to have a big problem ahead of us. Any point? Yeah, I'm not. Um, so first to address the, the, the lady in the back, and it, and it connects to what you said. Absolutely, there are islands around the world where the, the, the solutions uh, in terms of sea level rise are not what I um, uh, mentioned in my example, that was what we could do in Scotland. It's an example of, of something that is a choice for Scottish community. Um, we do, of course, in Scotland not have the most um, serious impacts of climate change, and we have to be grateful for that. Um, I think that we need to be... We need to be very clear about the different roles in terms of uh, climate change, um, um, you know, behaviour change, social change. The law has been mentioned, skills have been mentioned. You know, there's a lot that government can do, putting taxes up and down, deciding, you know, where does the money go? Follow, follow the money. That's, that's what happens. That's how you make change happen. At the moment, I would argue that a lot of climate change is asking people to swim against the tide, and it's really, really hard. If you buy an electric vehicle now, and electric vehicles have been around for a long time, and this has been talked about in policies for a long time, and you still need to be quite careful how you plan your trip around Scotland so you don't run out of charge. That should not be the case. And that is where we need to have the different parts of business and government and individuals, it needs to work much better together. And a lot of this has been put on individuals or put on individual businesses to come up with solutions. And that is not, that's not enough and that's not going to be quick enough. Uh, asking people who live in the kind of drafty tenements that, that I'm sure your constituency has a lot of, what are they going to do? You know, th and this is the problem where we have to have a, a completely different pace and scale in terms of, of the interventions, I would, I would argue. Any other? I think also uh, one's human behaviour is, is like, it, it always goes slower than, than, than you would hope for. And there are competing interests as well. So if you look, for example, from a food perspective, yeah, we, we can actually um, invest in, in, in better food products. But actually, if you look at sustainable foods, the cost per calorie is quite a bit higher. Uh, and that doesn't suit everyone. That suits perhaps the people that are interested in the topic. But if, if you are considering the cost of living crisis, that may not necessarily be the way forward. And we have to think about solutions there. Um, 
And then if people eating less meat, what do they eat instead? Because it has already been clear. If most people, when they go into a supermarket, you first decide what, what meat you will buy, and then you kind of add your vegetables to it, right? So if meat has to be reduced, what are you going to eat instead? For a lot of people, that's not clear. If you look at alternative meat solutions, or even the lab-grown meat, just bringing up another controversial issue, um, the, the alternative meat market is, is, is volatile, but also those products are often higher in fat, lower in micronutrients, and, and, and lower in fiber. So is that necessarily going to help us kind of looking at more long-term consequences. So the solutions, like what we were talking bef about before, some, sometimes the solutions are straightforward. And sometimes, actually, we need to get more data to see how this is going to pan out in the long term and whether there are not downstream consequences that we may regret later on. A thoughtful point. Um, yeah. So, um, hello, my name's Judith, and I run a theatre company called Gridiron in your constituency, oh, well, Ben. You, yeah. 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 Um, we have made uh, quite a number of high-profile productions with strong environmental themes and promoting um, positive behavioural change, um, as a huge number of our colleagues across art forms are doing. And we're also really working extremely hard to change our own behaviours within our industry um, to become more sustainable. However, it will come as no surprise that um, uh, I need to um, address the fact that the uh, cultural industries in Scotland at the minute are in the face of a, are in the grips of an existential funding crisis. Um, and we are a really effective, positive um, way to deliver public messages of good ways to change. So I just kind of ask the panel and the group here if we do agree it's possibly short-sighted to be sort of crippling an entire industry, the cultural industry, who can deliver those messages that we so badly need. I think such an um, important point about the, the, the power of culture and art in, in all social change and political change. Um, so thank you. Any comment on that? Um, I'd, I'd happily respond to that and slightly on the last one as well. There is... There's no question that the pace of change that we're seeing isn't enough, and it's debatable how quickly we can do that change. Um, I think the issue is how on earth do you make it happen uh, and get it to accelerate. It's not an easy thing to do. However, it's also very easy to... Um, is, if you stress too much about the timescale, you can overlook opportunities. And actually, one of the reasons I didn't get involved in climate education 25 years ago is because I didn't think we had time. And then 10 years later, I realised that one of the biggest barriers was a lack of education. And, that, and it isn't just scientific education. We've sort of touched on that as well. The problem with that is that those people who are going to be convinced by extreme messages have been convinced. Those people who are going to be convinced by the science have been convinced. But you need the cultural quarter to play because you want to get under people's skin. You need the heart to engage because that is how you win the majority. So it is actually critical that this, these sorts of ventures are supported because how else do you communicate this stuff? And actually, congr you know, great that you are doing it. My experience, years ago, I, I actually produced a short story book um, with a bunch of leading authors, and the one brief was that they weren't allowed to produce a dystopian version of the future. And, um, and they, every single one of them did. So they uh, completely, <laughs> completely failed. But, uh, but it is absolutely critical, that sort of cultural input. So. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The, so um, it's fascinating you talked about the dystopian. So um, I do a lot of writing. Uh, in, the, in the United States, the University of Arizona has something called the Hieroglyph Project. And the Hieroglyph Project, is, is its goal is to convince science fiction writers to write more hopeful science fiction so that the protagonists and the people and the world building in the story, they encounter a problem of some kind. But instead of it being a tragedy, they actually find a solution and in a heroic way work to solve the problem. Because the theory is, and the Hieroglyph's theory, really has a lot to do with the younger people who are sitting in the back, which is if you give people positive memories of the future about how we say, yes, these are big problems, but okay, there are people that we're going to try to fix them, right? Then it encourages people to fix them instead of throwing up their hands. Um, and at some point, I would love to hear from the folks 
and the young people in the back, um, the degree to which climate change has impacted your behavior or thinking about whether you want to have kids, for example. Um, I know from public opinion data, there's been a lot in the United States, a lot of concern among Gen Z about, you know, do I want to have a family or not because of this. So it would be interesting to get their perspective. Thank you. And you, you, uh, you, pro you, you beat me to it to try and prompt the young people at the back. Don't be shy. Come on. <laughs> we all want to hear from you. If, if one of you do want to speak or several of you, please. Um, and I think the point about popular culture is is, is so valid. And the, the, the last film about an optimistic future that I can remember was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and that was <laughs> quite a long time ago. Um, so we need more, definitely. I, sir, you, I, I said you would next, and then hopefully a, a, a hand will come up behind you. Go on, have the courage. Okay. There's some, part of this should be directed at the young people in the back and part of it to the panel in front of us. It, the question's mostly about what our goal should be in this entire process. And one part of that goal is sustainability. And historically, there was a time when human life was sustainable, but it was shit. Not the, directed to the young people. <laughs> you know, I mean, people were dying, children. Yeah, yeah. Please, please just child temper your language still. slightly, sir. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Excuse me. I was trying to be accurate, and I apologize for that. Now, there's a book which, oddly enough, has exactly the same title as this thing has, Not the End of the Earth, by a woman named Hannah Fritchie, and she was at the, at the book fair. And what she says is, our goal should not be just sustainability. It should be adequacy for everybody. I'm slightly misphrasing that, but the idea is that the young generation alive today could see the first time in human history that human life on this planet is both sustainable and adequate universally. Now, that's a really wonderful and very positive kind of a thing, but it's very hard to work for. Should this be our goal, and what do you think about our chances of getting it for them? Yeah. Any thoughts behind? Well, I would say as well that there's a responsibility um, on politicians to change the narrative to, to a more positive and determined, optimistic one, as well as uh, popular culture. So I've had um, a number of new hands come up over this side. Oh, and another one here. So... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass to yourself and then I'll come over to this side because I, I, I group, okay? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I sort of had two questions. One's more specific, uh, sort of to Professor DeRose. Um, I was wondering about meat consumption, whether if you're sourcing your beef locally, like literally kind of living next to the farm, does that make it guilt-free, or is it still kind of okay? Or even um, fish, because I've sort of, I've not eaten meat for a while, but I've still kind of been eating fish, and I don't know if that's still kind of not really okay. Um, and then the second part was, as someone who's about to go into university and have quite a busy life, is it enough to live sustainably, or do I need to be actively doing things that will reverse the effects. So, like, is it enough that I just source locally, stop eating meat, turn the lights off, or do I need to be going out and doing things? And what could I do if I have? Professor Darus, do you want to yeah, answer that briefly? Yeah, ambitious question. So I think we need to be clear, like, obviously kind of us being on this earth, us needing kind of food, Everything will have carbon emissions, where food is being produced, how it's processed, and, and, and how we eat it and how we cook it, right? So if you often cook a meal, that can add 20% to carbon <coughs> emissions, basically. It's better sometimes to microwave. So, um, and, and, and like, as scientists, we have ranked all these foods, like some foods that are better and worse, and 
if, if you look at the ranking, definitely kind of the beef is right on top, right, with carbon emission. And then you've got like pork and fish and poultry are somewhere in the middle. And then you've got all your vegetables. So, yeah, you can swap around vegetables. But in terms of impact, the impact is really if we kind of move away from beef to some extent. And you, you pose the question, can if I just buy it from my neighbor's farm, will that be better? Well, yeah, I think generally... Our food system is global, which means, like, I, I can I can talk about seafood, right? Because that is a bit my speciality. So, eighty percent of some of the seafood we produce in Scotland, and we produce a lot, is exported. Eighty percent of the seafood we eat in Scotland is imported, and it's crazy because it's actually we just like these big five. Kind of, we like the fish and chips and 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 the salmon, whereas. The salmon we produce is being exported and we import it from Norway. So there is a lot of transport. And transport doesn't always add a substantial amount to, of carbon emissions. It's more about how it's being produced, but it all adds to the total picture. So yeah, fish is, is better. And if you look at the Eat Lancet diet, for example, that has been proposed. Um, so we have to reduce our, our, our beef consumption, pork consumption, but we should increase the oily fish consumption. If you look at, we have modeled all the nutrients. We're exporting a lot of nutrients out of the country. If you look at the biggest exports for us are salmon, herring, and mackerel, right? They are incredibly rich in omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin B12, vitamin D, all the nutrients we need, but especially that adolescent girls need, or once you are like elderly, kind of you don't eat that much, so you really need kind of nutrient-dense foods. So... And we are exporting it out to all of the country. So what we're trying to do now is actually saying, what should we eat more of locally? Just Not just to be more sustainable, but also kind of to get more nutrients in. Uh, so so that these are all things we are, are thinking about. So And there are a lot of things we were talking before about. It's not just one solution. There's multiple solutions. Buying locally is one of them. Uh, buying fish instead of... Of, yeah, buying and eating fish instead of beef. Yeah, that these are all steps we should be making. And I think we should never lose attention about, we should always be proactive, what you mentioned. Like, yeah, you can make changes, but like try to convince your, your, your peers, kind of your family to do the same things, right? Because that's how we kind of start change. It's not just about what you do yourself, what you do with your community. So absolutely take that message forward if you are convinced that some things are better than others. The hands are flying up and we've, we're running out of time. So I'm going to take the gentleman's advice and, and do three, uh, which is yourself, then the lady behind you, and then the lady at the, the back. And then if I can, I'm going to come to you, OK? Just to say, a, an interesting issue in Scotland, of course, is that we, we now have too many deer who are eating too many sapling trees. So that's going to pre but present a situation. Venison is quite good, but then we don't have the processing capacity in Scotland to deal with it. So we could actually have a lot more venison on the shelves in the supermarket if we would have more processing facilities here in Scotland. Well, well my question actually leads on from that. So as, as you know, I'm Andy, sorry, my name is Alex. I'm a, a conservation biologist. And we allocate millions of hectares around the world for beef production and for for stuff to feed to cattle. And it's an incredibly bad use of land. And we've got a climate crisis. We've got a biodiversity crisis. And one of the best ways to address both is to restore ecosystem functioning. And it's not just planting a trillion trees. It's, we've got UNESCO World Heritage peatlands in Scotland now. But it's restoring fresh water. It's restoring marine habitats. It's restoring these habitats that will sequester millions of tonnes of, of carbon and help the biodiversity. Now, that needs investment, but we are sitting in Edinburgh where there's millions and billions of dollars of pension funds, and London is pension funds, and those pension funds go uh, quite often to, to fund oil and gas. They, they go to fund armaments that are used to kill people in Gaza or wherever. Well, should, should they not be used to, to address the climate crisis? Should they not be used to ad address the biodiversity crisis? And should we not be restoring our ecosystems and meet our 30-30 requirements in 2030. It's probably a question for the government, uh, but I'd be interested in anyone's views. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a pensions law question and the duties of trustees. Um, so it's a U UK government function and, and one that is absolutely an important question to ask. Uh, and um, thank you, sir, uh, for all of that. Um, I'm, just, I'm going to take your advice and take three questions before <coughs> I come to the panel. So uh, the person behind you is uh, looking to, to speak. Hello. Um, 
it was more just a comment on how we go about dealing with the environmental crisis. So I think it's important to keep people hopeful through community and intersectionality. I think a lot of young people feel like they're disconnected due to capitalism. It's a very individualistic way of living that's not suitable for majority of people, I would say. Um, just an example from the community I live in is generally quite a deprived area, but in recent years they've changed that through community community gardens and um, there's a beekeeping association as well that works closely with the school to encourage children and uh, um, from nursery age up how to care for bees and hives and themselves and how that works with the garden and um, you're then in those environments getting people from all generations involved knowledge is then passed down I think education is incredibly important I like the topics that have been brought up through education and the culture and arts and how that educates people and empowers people. I think we need more of that. I think, um, yeah, community and intersectionality is a massive thing that needs to be considered because I think it's looked down on a lot or it feels impossible. How do we encourage governments to put community at the core of everything that we do? Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to help us. Thank you. And uh, just a few rows behind, please. Um, thank you. Um, I, I've attended a number of events at this festival and the book festival recently and I've been so impressed by experts who have so many solutions to offer and that's where my optimism comes from. But um, I suppose this is a plea for our politicians to catch up and be braver. And I had hope the other night when I listened to Sadiq Khan talking about his experience over the introduction of the, early, the low emission zones in London and how... You know, when that, that came up in the by-election, it played badly for him. Um, but he stuck to his guns. And although he lost the by-election, subsequently, the Labour regained that seat. And the point he made was, the politicians have to be braver and have to realise that the public, in many instances, are ahead of them. And instead of fearing to lose votes, and, and this is a plea for all the young people at the back... <laughs> exercise your vote don't let anybody tell you it doesn't matter or your voice doesn't count it absolutely does and I'm asking you too Ben uh, it'd be good to see some of our politicians taking responsibility for the actions or inaction and being a bit more courageous thank you and, and, and I, I, I hear the, ch the challenge and the charge uh, and uh, I, I agree with you and, we, and one thing we need to do more of in here is is motivate each other and, and have less political tribalism. And that's something I've tried to be a champion of in this building. And we've actually got a session tomorrow on this here as well. <laughs> Respectful dialogue. Um, thank you for all of your contributions there. Um, Panellists, do you want to add anything on finance, community and political action? If, and if I can, I'll take, take the final question. So, anything you want to say? Um, real quick, I'll address two of your things. Um, so in the United States, on the pension side, there's been a lot of back and forth at the states because the states have the employee, public employee pensions about whether um, environmental considerations or other ESG matters are included or not. And that's gone to the state legislatures in a number of states. And so it's, it's a very interesting read um, across the Atlantic just to see how, how that's playing out. I think it's interesting. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to throw a, a little bit of a, a difference of opinion on capitalism. I will make the plea for capitalism. <laughs> so um, it, my view is, is that capitalism will create enough wealth, innovation, and incentive to actually help us out and through some of these things. Because it's really, really about dealing with scarcity and pricing scarcity. And so over time, to give you one example, the former CEO of Walmart used to say green is green. And he would admit that he was not an environmentalist. But he would also admit that inviting in sustainability groups to help him green his supply chain made him a lot more money. And that's what he wanted to do. So I do think there is a way to actually use market incentives to further what we're trying to do here. And I, that may or may not be an unpopular opinion, but I'll be the lone voice for capitalism. <laughs> um, I, have a, I mean, 
mean, first of all, that's a form of constrained capitalism because, of course, the whole point is that you create parameters in which it operates and arguably there's not quite enough of those in some areas and there's maybe too many in others, who knows. Um, but I think actually that's a quite important point and it slightly plays into the issue around pensions. Then we need to wake people up to the issue of stranded assets where you're invested in things that looked traditionally like safe investments and are slowly becoming less and less safe. And we need to really make people more aware of that, make people more sensitive to that, because the tension at the moment is there's an awful lot of business as usual behaviour. And I think part of the issue is that people still think climate change is optional, touching on your point earlier. It's not optional, it's already happening, and so the more we do and the quicker we do it, the less we have to be concerned about. But um, obviously, you know, we really do want to see that acceleration. And there's things in the background that I'm aware of. For example, I, I understand that oil and gas standardly now assumes they're going to have a £40 carbon tax, um, you know, for, and, but they, but no, most people aren't charging them. But they, they predicate all new developments on the assumption that they will have at least a £40 a tonne carbon tax. But we're not charging them. And then we wonder why they're making loads of money and we've not got any money to do anything else. So we do need to put some of these policies in place and these processes in place that help create and, and sort of develop these links. And touching on the community point very quickly, for me, climate change ultimately is actually, go, um, at least in the short to medium term, is a, is a justice issue and community involvement is absolutely critical. And it is the poorest who are going to pay for it. It's already happening globally, and it will happen within our own countries too. So for me, deep injustice is unsustainable anyway, which touches on your point about sustainability. I don't think we've ever been sustainable, but I do think we now recognise that that's a mistake. Um, and the optimism for me in all of this is this desire that, I, well, my view, that actually almost everything is up for grabs because we need to do everything better than we have. So, um, there was a, a final question, then I'm going to ask the panel to sum up, I'm afraid. Um, so, do you want to ask your final question? No pressure. <laughs> it's actually going back So to this young person sitting next to me. So, my name's Kirsty Tate. I work for the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And with food, um, we're running what's called a food conversation. We're asking citizens, what do they want from food? And citizens are more thoughtful, engaged, understand far more than we probably give them credit for. But they are swimming against the stream at the moment in terms of our food economy. And it makes me really sad to hear the guilt that young people carry about what they eat because they are facing an environment that has never been this way in terms of the pressure and the advertising and how we, we are just not protecting our young people from that. So it's very, very hard to make the right choices at the moment because we have a food industry that is pushing unsustainable, unhealthy choices on our young people. There's an amazing organisation called Bite Back, youth-led organisation, that are doing amazing work. And if you want to put... You know, it's not, this is not about individuals. We have to understand this is an environment in which people work and live in and... We have to start changing that. And where's the responsibility? The responsibility doesn't last with the individual in this. We've got to make this tide easier to swim against. And at the moment, I don't want young people, like the one beside myself, carrying the guilt for the changes that we have created as a society and we are enabling them to live in. We've got to change that for them. So, thank you. A powerful, a powerful call for collective responsibility is our last question. Th thank you very much. And, Thank you to all of you who, who asked a question and, and made, made a number of comments. Uh, really, really excellent and helpful. Um, I'm now just going to allow our panellists a minute or so to sum up with any final thoughts and calls for action, points of consideration, points of reflection. And Marta, do you want to go first? Well, I just, you know, I, I agree with Kirsty. That's what I have to say from that one. Um, no, I think, I think you're absolutely right. So I, I think what I take from this conversation uh, and, and the questions is that there are a lot of people, as was mentioned, that a lot of people would like governments to do more. And I think the public are ready for a lot more action than what we're seeing. And it's not quite clear to me why it's not happening. Some of it maybe because of, of big business not wanting change, because change is, 
is painful, whether you're a business or an individual, it, it can be a difficult thing to go through. I think we won't get anywhere by guilt tripping each other. I don't think we'll get anywhere by competing in how green or virtuous we can be. I think there are huge uh, benefits that can be had from proper public community engagement around these issues to really talk about what kind of communities, what kind of Scotland do we want to live in? How do we want the change that we have to go through? How do we want that to pan out uh, in, into that future that we can create? And I, I genuinely believe that there are some big positives that we can take. And I think that we should all, whether we have an investment portfolio or we have a, a window box, we can do something that makes a difference for climate change and biodiversity. And I think that we should, we should do that. You know, we should be practical and helpful and constructive to one another as well uh, and not be, be uh, you know, beat each other over the head with a stick because we're not being virtuous. I take an international flight every year because I have family that doesn't live in the Br British Isles. And I am not going to say that that makes me a hypocrite. I am being honest about that. That is how my life has panned out. And I want to, you know, that's, that's the kind of constructive and positive. I think we have to be honest. We have to be, put our best foot forward. Uh, and I, I really think that the, the, the power of public and the power of imagination that can come through from, from the cultural sector, I think that we, uh, this is not the end of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? Sure. Um, humans are tool makers. That's why we're here. We create our technology, then our technology creates us. And uh, my view is that this is largely a technological issue and that we need to focus. We need to do what humans do best, which is create new technology. And of course, AI may play a role in that, which we didn't get into, which is one of the other massive issues that we face quite today. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Mike? Um, a very quick story then. I used to sit on the First Minister's Business Advisory Board with a lot of senior businesses in Scotland, and uh, I assumed uh, big business was uh, ooh, the devil incarnate, and they didn't want to do anything about climate change because they didn't care. And it turned out they just didn't know what they were supposed to do. And actually, I realised after a couple of years that government was sitting there waiting to be told what business was going to do for them, and businesses were sitting there wondering what government wanted them to do. Uh, and sensing a vacuum, actually, we wrote a climate solutions qualification for businesses because <laughs> nobody else was, and uh, it needed to be given that sort of guidance. So I guess m my main interest is not necessarily in who to blame in any of this. It's much more focused on who's going to come and help solve it. And that's, that's why I remain positive in this. However, I think it's really important to say that if we're serious about climate change, we have to fund it. And at the moment, we're not. We're trying to do it on the side of the desk and voluntarily, and somehow we've got to put money there. So the young people at the back, there should be a future generations fund established from other means that's generated a bit like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund that genuinely invests in your future in a positive way. And I think that's the sort of thing that we need to be calling for. And, but one of the ways you get that is you have brave politicians. So this is a call back to everybody here. If you want brave politicians, you have to embolden them you have to talk to them and tell them that the only way you're going to vote for them is if they do this stuff, because they won't do it on their own. You've got to help create that space too. And so I think my call to you is help your politicians be brave. <laughs> Professor Derus. Yeah, I think I'm going to end with like something food related again. Like I think it's all about choices, about the choices we've got and in, in, in what to do. And, I think people have to remember that it is a very demand-driven food system. So it's really up to us what we like and what is going to be produced. So we are in charge of, of that change. And I think people should, should know that we are in charge. And it looks sometimes that like our choices are there because of the retailers put things out in certain ways. They have certain advertisements and marketing and and that's true i mean the food choice at the moment is for all the unhealthy products for the chocolate for the, the chips and if you go to a, like a vegetable aisle there is very limited choice so yeah we have food choice but for the wrong things but actually a food system is kind of driven by demand so we have actually an opportunity to make changes and i hope that 
that, op that opportunity will be given to us in the next year. There will be opportunities for, for people to change that demand and for bold people like, like yourself just to make that change. So, and there will be opportunities. We just have to ask harder for it and demand harder for it. A call to action. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for your presence and your contributions. I'm afraid we must leave it there. You will receive a communication about how to feed back on the Festival of Politics. The team are really keen to, to hear your thoughts. So please do contribute to that uh, if you have the time. Um, a big thanks to our BSL interpreters again. And a big thanks to our panellists. Um, please join me in thanking them. Enjoy the rest of the day. There's a climate cafe this afternoon. There's more events over the next days uh, until the end of, of tomorrow. So uh, thank you for being part of the Festival of Politics and uh, best wishes to you and a safe journey home. Thank you all.